Hi, everyone. Get ready for the How I Raised It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Donnell Baird of Block Power, a Brooklyn startup making buildings greener and smarter. We talk about the Silicon Valley archetype and how Black founders can fit this archetype, how he pitched Ben Horowitz, uh, a lot of interesting stuff in this episode. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome pack for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 of the most important questions that serious investors are going to ask you. So this pack will truly get you prepared to rock your fundraise. To get this instantly, click the link in the description below. It's free and you will be ready to pitch with confidence. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them. Hit that subscribe button to get the latest episodes. Thank you so much. Enjoy the chat with Donnell. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Donald Baird of Block Power coming to us from Brooklyn. How's your day going? It's good. It's warm. It's spring. It's great. Springtime in Brooklyn. It sounds good. Baseball's happening, and uh, I don't know. N- NBA playoffs around the corner. We got the Nets. We got my beloved Knicks, who for the first time in 20 years are good. I'm excited. It's good. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Knicks. Um, yeah, you don't, <laughs> you don't hear as much <laughs> I haven't about heard much about their triumphs over the last 20 years, but here we are. They're good. They're good this year. Well, we had our good little run with the, the Golden State Warriors. You know, it's, yeah. it's we had our fun. And Steph Curry's still doing some amazing stuff. He's, so. he's having an amazing season. My God. He's amazing. Right. He's a, he's a machine. He's not human. Anyway, let's talk about you guys. What is Block Power? What do you guys do? So we're, we're building a platform to analyze, finance, and project manage the construction of green upgrades, sustainable upgrades uh, in buildings that save money, save energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're trying to turn buildings into Teslas. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. Just like a Tesla, it's all electric, it's smart, it's powerful. Um, it's got cutting edge software. It's just way better than a normal old school fossil fuel car. We can now do that with buildings, right? We can take the fossil fuel equipment and energy systems out of your building, replace it with all electric, um, uh, equipment that's powered by renewable energy that's connected to the internet. That's powered by great software. So we, we, we can turn buildings into Tesla. So we've built a platform, um, that allows us to analyze uh, finance and do some workflow project management stuff, uh, to turn your building into a Tesla. Interesting. So let's take a scenario. You've got a, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 unit high rise or something like that. It's old. I'm assuming most of the, most yep. of the time and you're coming in as the building owner hiring you. And then what exactly are you doing? Yeah, that's right. So the building owner, um, would hire us. We would have them fill out a 10 minute quiz about, hey, what kind of fossil fuel do, system do you have? Do you use oil? Do you use gas? Do you have heating, air conditioning? You're out in Marin County. And so, you know, you might not have a ton of heating or spend a, a ton of money on heating, but might spend a lot of money on air conditioning, certainly more and more with the with the climate crisis happening. I know the Bay Area is heating up. It's heating um, up. I just, not yet, but I just bought an $18 fan at CVS for the, uh, the <laughs> attic. So I'm, you there know. you go. It's heating up. Um, so we've been helping people in the Bay Area get high efficiency air conditioning and hot water heating systems. So anyway, we're going to co- do a quick 10 minute survey of your building that you fill out on your iPhone or your laptop about your building, about your equipment. Um, we want you to tell us how much you spend annually, annually on your energy costs. And we're going to try to replace all of the fossil fuel equipment in your building with all new, all electric equipment. Um, we're going to send you a quote and we're going to lease you that equipment for 15 years mm. after that lease is over. You'll own it. You lease it like you lease a car. 
Um, but after it's over, you own the equipment in your building. And uh, we're going to finance the installation of that equipment. We're going to project manage it. We're going to find you a certified uh, construction company locally that's going to install it for you. And we're going to provide a warranty that that equipment is going to function. It's going to save you money. We're going to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 70%, 70. Um, so you're going to save a bunch of money. Your building's going to be 11% more valuable. You're going to save money. And you're helping to save the planet, which feels good. And your, your building's going to be much more comfortable because the equipment that we're installing is new, right? So your tenants can control it. They can manage to their own comfort and needs instead of running a, a, you know, a gas system or whatever, or an oil system. So um, that's what we do. So we've worked in over 1,100 buildings, uh, mostly in New York City, but we've got projects in the Bay Area, in the upper Midwest, in Michigan, Chicago, Milwaukee, down in D.C., Maryland, Baltimore, um, and Boston. Interesting. How did you get into this or, or what were you doing right before this? I was uh, in B-School and halfway okay. through B-School started a company. But before that, uh, was a consultant to the Obama administration and the U.S. Department of Energy around workforce development for green construction. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, during the 2009 financial collapse and the stimulus and recovery, we invested billions and billions of dollars in clean energy and energy efficiency. Elon Musk got a $500 million loan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things we were trying to do was green a bunch of buildings and we needed to create a new construction workforce in order to do that. So I, I worked on that for three years, uh, partnered with a bunch of investment banks, utility companies, the federal government to try to create this new workforce that could generate green construction bonds, muni bonds. Uh, some of it worked, some of it didn't. So after a few years, I thought it was valuable as a market to explore, um, but I didn't know what a market was because I was a community organizer, didn't know anything about business. So I went to Columbia Business School, learned about uh, finance business, and then started Block Power halfway through. So I've been working on this problem of green buildings for 10 years, 11 years at this point. And we're just now starting to see uh, the scalable solutions that it's going to take to kind of take over the whole market. Um, and so we're expanding to, you know, 20 or 25 cities later this year. So super exciting times for us. Well, 1100 billion is already a lot. So let's talk about raising capital for this. You started this in mm -hmm. business school. How did you finance it in those early days? It sounds like a capital intensive business. Uh, yep. Talk about getting off the ground, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, started doing some pitch competitions. Uh, got third place in a pitch competition in business school, won $2,500, uh, wrangled a $5,000 grant from a, a club at Columbia Business School, the Green Business Club. I said, <laughs> look, instead of throwing a party, why don't we try to go off into Harlem near Columbia and green some barbershops and restaurants mm. near the school and, and, and do something to green New York City? Uh, and so was able to convince my fellow classmates to do that. So had $7,500 of working capital to get rolling. Uh, so, 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 you know, spent 250 bucks on LegalZoom to, to incorporate and uh, started the business, you know, uh, in the middle of my second year. Um, but then right before graduating, applied for uh, to win a contract from the United States federal government. Um, I don't know if you ever saw that movie War Dogs with Jonah Hill, the actor. He like wins a contract to sell weapons to Iraq or whatever. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it wasn't that exciting, but we were a tiny company with no employees and we applied for and won a federal government contract for uh, 4 million bucks. So we had to mm -hmm. rapidly uh, uh, try and, you know, hire some personnel, get some accountants and lawyers in place in order to access that federal contract. Um, and I had to actually skip my final exam in B school to go down to the white house and hmm. win the contract. And the hmm. professor failed me. Screw him. Uh, <laughs> He's he, a business he said, school I, professor. He should understand that, right? <laughs> he should understand. But he yeah. said, if you skip this exam, I'm going to fail you. So he failed me. And then I had to take an, a makeup class, which fortunately was a lean, lean entrepreneurship, lean launchpad class at Columbia, which was incredibly helpful. So, so, you know, we had, we had a little bit of money. We won a federal contract. And then we won our first uh, seed capital investment from a foundation called Echoing Green mm. in New York, um, which focuses on you know, nonprofits and startups that want to have a social or environmental impact. So they invested $70,000. 
And that investment was let, what let me persuade my wife to, to let me start this company instead of forcing me to become a consultant at mm-hmm. Deloitte or, or whatever. Um, so that they were, they were our first investor, which was great, them in the U.S. government. But in order to qualify uh, for that U.S. government contract, I needed to raise a million dollars. Mm. So I had to have a million dollars of cash on hand to qualify to receive, you know, two million dollars from the federal government. And um, so that's why we had to start a proper venture capital fundraising round of our pre-seed round. So I talked to 205 people. Everybody said no. Hmm. Then finally, we worked our way out to Silicon Valley, met with Mitch Kapoor and Kapoor Capital. And then met with uh, Ben Horowitz at Andreessen Horowitz. And this is back in 2014. Interesting. So that's interesting. Let's unpack that a little bit. Why did 200 people say no? Was there a commonality? And then meeting with Ben Horowitz is kind of like meeting with, you know, a rock star. So how did you land that meeting? Uh, is there mm-hmm. any story behind mm-hmm. it? <laughs> he, he is a rock star or definitely a hip hop star. Um, um, and I love yeah. him. I mean, he's, he's fantastic. So so yeah, I mean, let's start at the beginning. We we had some people in our business school network who were willing to host uh, some initial pitch meetings for me. I remember our first, even one of our first pitch meetings had like 15 different investors. They all gathered together for lunch to listen to me pitch. And I think like half of them got up in the middle of pitch and just like walked out. Just oh boy. <laughs> we're like, hey, talk to you later, man. I don't know. You know, I, I ate my lunch. I'm done. This pitch is trash. <laughs> um, but, uh, so we didn't get off to a good start. Um, I never try to parse no's from VCs. Like who knows what the fuck reason they have for saying no. Like uh-huh. they got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning. They, they have like a dry cough. Like, I don't, I don't know yeah. why VCs do what they do, but you know, they didn't, they didn't see a market. Um, we were at the time focusing on greening religious institutions and low-income buildings, which is what we still focus on. And I think the VCs, you know, didn't see a market. And so, you know, it turned out to be a situation where you kind of have to understand underserved communities. Mm -hmm. You have to understand communities of color to see the value um, in the market that, that, that we were targeting. And so even though it's a giant market, I don't think the VCs had familiarity with it. They didn't know the customers. They didn't understand it. So yep. they just didn't have a good sense of what would be necessary to like grow and scale into our specific market of low income and or underserved urban buildings. And so, um, you know, got hundreds and hundreds of no's. Um, undeterred, you know, landed a meeting with Ben Horowitz, landed a meeting with Mitch Kapoor. Um, Mitch... It took a few meetings. He gave us some tough, early, useful feedback. Hey, where, where the hell is you guys chief technology officer? What's, what's going mm-hmm. on here? Yeah. How are you going to build a startup? You don't have a CTO. And then when we went to Ben, we said, look, <laughs> we need a CTO. The rumor is that Andreessen Horowitz um, provides you know, services to founders. And the service that we need right now, even more than money, we need, we need to find a CTO. Maybe you guys can help us do that. Um, and, and, and so Ben, um, you know, we went through the pitch, he understood it. He understood the market, gave us some tough feedback, but at the end of the day, both he and Mitch decided to invest. Mm-hmm. Um, Ben had actually worked for Mitch back in the day, oh, I, didn't I think know at that. Lotus. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but they had not like met and so connected them on email. They both decided to invest. And so that's, that's how we were able to do our pre-seed round and, um, and um, get get our company started by accessing this first customer contract we have with the Department of Energy. Okay. So I was too dumb. I didn't I didn't know how famous and powerful Mitch K. Poor and Ben Horowitz were. I will freely, if I had known then what I know now, I'm sure I would have messed up the <laughs> the pitches. I'm positive, like positive. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, had, so. How did you actually get the intro to Ben? And was it through a, a Columbia Business School contact or some other roundabout way? So Chris Dixon, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, introduced me to Ben. And Chris and I met at a Columbia 
business school event. So Columbia is actually our second investor. So Equity okay. Green, then Columbia Business School wrote us a $25,000 check. And they, they didn't want to do equity because they were like, we don't know what's going on with this business. So we got to do debt. Um, but they, they had a, a meeting. I can't remember if it was a board of directors meeting or something, but Chris Dixon was there. I, I gave him like a 30 second pitch. He was like, hey, here's my card. When you're raising, come out to Silicon Valley, talk to me. Okay. Um, I did. So I pitched Chris first. And then Chris said, hey, this is interesting. You know who might be interested? My partner, Ben. Um, and wow. Ben, you know, immediately responded. I flew back out to California the next week. We had a pitch. Um, and the, the, the thing about Andreessen Horowitz that I love and k Capital is they are founder friendly. So I'd gotten hundreds of no's, was like dejected, rejected, demoralized. And the speed with which they made the decision mm, and then yeah. just wired the capital. And like, that was it. Like there was no hemming and hawing and, you know, they did their diligence. It took like three days. And then they're like, yeah, we're investing. Send us your bank information. Like, let's go. Like, let's build this company. And from that day to this, they've been with me the whole way. Mm. I talk to them literally every week, still like five, six years later. And they are both a tremendous source of like support and education uh, for me as a founder. That's great. How much was that pre-seed round? Uh, we ended up raising like a million bucks. Yeah. And then most recently, um, you did the big Series A, which was 63 million, 55 million of debt, 8 million equity. Looking yep. at the press release. Um, any stories there? It looks like the Goldman Sachs Urban Investment Group, which is sort of interesting. Any, any stories or anecdotes or interesting parts from this most recent round? Yeah. So in, in, in this recent round, um, you know, in, in, let's say the end of 2018 Q4, we did a seed round where we raised like, I want to say 3 million. And Andreessen Horowitz uh, reinvested with Kpor Capital. Kpor Capital led the round. So incredibly grateful to them for that. I mean, we, in 2018, we thought the business might be going under, mm. you know, co-founder quit, um, you know, uh, you know, six of our senior executives quit uh, or I fired some people. Like, it just looked like the company might not survive. Really difficult time. Mm. Um, they were emailing all of our investors saying that the company's trashed and, you know, mm -hmm. what a shame it was that Block Power was failing. Um, but Mitch and Ben both decided to believe in the company and they reinvested in, in, a, in, a, in a moment that was very, very dark for our company. They both showed up and they both provided significant capital. We were able to raise a $3 million round led by K4 Capital. Like till the day I die, like I'll forever be grateful and loyal. to. I'm not a person that you can criticize K4 Capital or Andrews and Hearts. Like, I don't want to hear it. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not the person to, be like, well, they should do this. And they, no, screw you. Like they're, they're good in my book. So that we did the, we did the seed round, which was incredibly helpful. And then, um, and then a few, a few months later, the pandemic hit. And mm. so, um, you know, Ben had a phone call with me or we did a zoom, I think where he was like, look, this pandemic is going to be long and it's going to be terrible. And it's going to be much longer than people think. This was like, this was like, April of 2020. He's like, mm -hmm. look, Danelle, you, you need to raise capital that's going to last you 36 months was what he was recommending. And he spent an hour with me and a few other founders really talking us through prior recessions, what he had seen in, in, in Silicon Valley during prior recessions and really giving us advice Mm -hmm. on how to prepare for this recession and how to navigate it in a worst case scenario. You know, the hard thing about hard things like that's Ben. So he showed up to be like, yo, this is going to be hard. Like let's, let's rock. Right. And so I talked to Ben and then I had my, um, I had my check-in with Mitch. We talk every week. Um, and, 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 and Mitch was really pushing me. Well, there is a pandemic and a recession. What is block powers? way of showing up to support customers going to be in a difficult time. Mm. That is separate from how are we going to make a bunch of money? How are we going to survive? Like 
there's a separate question of like, how are we going to help people in a moment of crisis for our entire country and for the whole world? And he really pushed me on that. Mm. So then, um, you, you know, uh, you know, we, we started to have some preliminary conversations with Kpor Capital about putting together another round. Um, and AmFam, our, you know, a $10 billion insurance conglomerate, like major corporation. Um, they own the general.com. If you ever see the, oh, sure. the cartoon uh-huh. general yeah. with the big white mustache. Yeah. Like uh-huh. they own that. And then they own a couple home insurance companies. So they had invested with A16Z in the round led by k Capital, our seed round. Uh, they put in like half a million or something like that. They called me and were like, look, like we're ready to lead your series A. Like let's, wow. let's do this. So, um, uh, we, we organized a round, um, led by AmFam and John McIntyre there, who had spent a bunch of time at Cisco, was a Kaufman fellow, knocked around the Valley, then moved back home to Madison, Wisconsin, where he's from to work with AmFam and their, their venture team. Um, and then Dwight Poehler, who I like to call the Mitt Romney of, of Europe. He was a Bain Capital executive. Um, for 18 years in Europe in their private equity group where he's a partner. He, he ran that operation. Mm-hmm. Um, he went into retirement, set up a VC fund foundation, and he and his new fund decided to invest in Block Power as their first investment. So they and Kapor Capital and Goldman co-led the round. Um, uh, Salesforce put in a significant amount of money and um, the New York State venture capital arm mm-hmm. uh, put in some money. And uh, Marlon Nichols at Mac, Mac Venture Capital put in some capital, as well as uh, Zach, the CEO of OpenGov. Mm-hmm. He and some other angels put in some money, which was really significant to me because I really rely on them for mentorship. Zach is like so good at fundraising, running his company, understands the ins and outs of traditional Silicon Valley. He's like a master. He's like total opposite of me. What's his um, name, Zach? Who? God, what the fuck is Zach's last name? Zach at OpenGov. Uh, it. it'll, it'll come to me in like 30 yeah, seconds, I'm no sure. Worries. Um, you remember when Jared Kushner had this like startup to the White House and it was like so controversial because he was uh-huh. invested in it? It was, that's Zach. Oh, oh, he's amazing. Okay. He's amazing. <laughs> um, but he sells, he sells like uh, workflow management software and, um, you know, uh, visualization software and um, workflow software to city governments around the, the country. And they built this amazing business. I think Andreessen introduced me to him. Um, and he's been a great advisor and friend and mentor to help me like learn how to fundraise. I think, I think there's one more story that I really want to share about this A round, if that's yeah, helpful. Go for it. So remember Justin Kahn had this legal services startup called Atrium? Yep. Atrium wanted to provide legal services to companies doing their Series A, right? On the legal side. So they would host these fundraising coaching sessions. Hey, you're about to do your Series A. Why don't you come out to San Francisco? We'll do a one-day or two-day workshop with you on how to fundraise, right? So I flew out to San Francisco to join Justin Kahn and Michael Seibel at this thing. So they had Michael Mm -hmm. Seibel from Y Combinator. And then they had um, another entrepreneur who I won't name do a three hour workshop with us on how to raise funds. Totally blew my mind. Seibel was like, you need to have coffee with VCs on a regular basis. And then someone may offer you a preemptive term sheet. And Mm -hmm. that is what happened to us in the pandemic. Um, And so he kind of like forecasted that. But this workshop with this other entrepreneur was really deep for me because he was like, I know we were, up on time, but he was like, he was like Silicon Valley, there's an archetype of a founder that they want to invest in. It's a Caucasian male, 19 year old college dropout from an elite university, Steve Jobs from dropping out from Reed College, Mm -hmm. you know, Zuckerberg dropping out of Harvard, like Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard. Like this is what Silicon Valley wants. And he said, I am a six foot three athletic, like This guy looked like an Adonis, right? He was on the rowing team at Stanford or some shit. He looked like a Greek god. And um, he was like, he's like, you, Danelle, may look at me and say, VCs want to give you capital. You're like a 6'3 white dude with a computer science degree from Stanford. 
but I actually don't fit the archetype either. He's like, you don't fit it because you're black hmm. and you're non-technical. He's like, I'm technical, but I, I didn't drop out. I didn't drop out of Harvard. Like I'm too tall. I'm too athletic. I'm a jock. Like I don't fit this archetype either. And he's <laughs> like, so you have to work to persuade VCs to like look past that pattern recognition and archetype. Mm -hmm. And so do I. And so these are the mechanisms that I've used to try to replicate as much of that pattern matching as I can, even down to like, if you agree to go to a VC's conference room and pitch them, apparently that's a no go. Like you're, you, you're, you're, you violated some unwritten rule of being an alpha male in Silicon Valley. Right. And so like, he just explained all that stuff to me, incredibly helpful to me in learning how to fundraise in a, in a methodology that mm. Silicon Valley can recognize and respect, which I think is critical to women, to minorities, and even to white dudes who need to learn how Silicon Valley and VC operates. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Talk about, you know, kind of the, the Silicon Valley archetype and how to fit into that if you don't fit into this archetype. Kind of expand on that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert at this by any means, but it was interesting and like helpful. And I hate the word empowering, but it really was empowering to, to kind of learn that there is this archetype and it needs to be like managed and navigated. The amount of distance that you have to that archetype needs to be managed and navigated. And so yeah this 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 dude who is kind of mentoring me on this he was like closer to this archetype than i am right yeah. he's technical he's caucasian he lives in san francisco right so he's closer to the archetype than i am because i'm non-technical i live in new york i didn't move to the valley um i'm black so he's closer than i am but what needs to be figured out is like how are you going to close the gap between yourself and that archetype in the minds of VCs so that they can get to the comfort level that they need in order to feel comfortable writing the check and yeah. investing and growing your company. And so um, I think, you know, it's like, you know, no, it, it's like the saying goes, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is persuading people that he didn't exist. Like the archetype exists, right? And like, now that you know it exists, <laughs> right? And that it's real, now you can manage it and plan for it. One of my one of my best friends, Phaedra, who's raised like 30 million for her, um, her startup come out of Y Combinator, African-American woman. Um, she manages this. She's like, look, like there's investors that I love that I refuse to meet with. Like socially, we'll get dinner, we'll hang out. I'm not going to pitch them on my business because it's just a bad fit. And I know that they are focused on this archetype. And so she will screen them out because she thinks they're too wedded to that archetype and she just knows she's not a fit. So I, I think there's a kind of freedom that comes from being clear, hey, there is an archetype, it has to be managed and navigated. So you know, obviously, how do you sort of close the, that gap though? Because you can't become white. You can't, you know, <laughs> you can't uh, necessarily become technical overnight. You could, of course, eventually become technical. So you know, how do you sort of manage that? Or do you just find the people that uh, you kind of click with that, you know? Uh, no, yeah, I think, I think that's the right question, right? The advice that he gave to me was, you can't change who you are, mm -hmm. but you can simulate elements of the way that a young Bill Gates or a brash young Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. might interact with a VC, right? You can yeah. simulate some of the feelings or scenarios that those guys impose on VCs and you can simulate them for yourself. So the example that was given to me is like, look, 19 year old Mark Zuckerberg, he doesn't give a shit about VCs, right? He's like late to the meetings. He shows up, he's wearing flip flops. Maybe you can't get away with all that because you're not building Facebook and you don't have the data. But in some ways you're signaling that you're not vulnerable you're not begging for money. You're building a giant business. It's going to be a huge business. And you're going to make this VC a ton of money if they're lucky. Yeah. Right. They should be so lucky as to be able to invest in your company. And how do you have that mindset in a real way 
And then what are the ways that you're subtly or directly communicating that in your pitch meetings is a, a, another topic that must be managed. And like that, like you can't change who you are, how tall you are, how short you are, your gender, your race, but you can say, I'm a super confident entrepreneur who's gonna build a billion dollar business within the next year or two, like either get on board or yeah. don't waste my fucking time because there's somebody else who's gonna take your spot. And you kind of need to be thoughtful about communicating that because that is the, that is what an investor wants to see in an entrepreneur that they're gonna back. And if you don't bring that element to the table, you're doing yourself a disservice mm -hmm. and you're doing the investor a disservice. Does that make sense? It does, it does, it does. How do you walk the tightrope of being extremely confident yet not being just an ass, you know, like, and being the cocky and like, just a, cause you don't want, if I was investing, I wouldn't want someone that's gonna be a pain in the ass to work with that will never take any advice or mentorship, right? But you want also that guy or gal who's gonna bust through walls, so. Any, yeah, 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 I think, <laughs> and I, I had this question too, because I was always raised to be like super polite and mannerable. So I think there's a difference between confidence and being a jerk, right? So you can be confident and like stable and centered. And, yep. you know, an investor might ask you a question and you might say, you know, politely, look, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question for you. That's not something that we disclose. Like, so for example, I get a ton of questions around, well, how much money has Andrews and Hearts invested in you? That's not, you know, we don't provide answers about uh, the individual positions of our investors. Just like after you invest, I'm not going to run around and run my mouth telling everybody how much money you put into the company. I'm not, I'm not going to do that for you. So I think there's ways to be polite, but strong. Um, and that's what leadership really is, right? Is like, you're strong, but you're warm. You're mm -hmm. not a jerk. You're not an ass. Um, you're, you're mannerable, but you're strong and you're confident. And so I think learning how to do that, I think was like a, a good leadership skill generally sure. beyond fundraising for me. And, um, and then the second part is how do you navigate like all of the imposter syndrome or whatever it is mm, yeah. so that you like feel the confidence in your, in your bones. Um, and so part of it is sometimes you're not going to feel the confidence in your bones, but you still got to go forward and simulate that confidence. That's part of what fundraising is. And so if investors want to see, maybe you're not confident all the way, but, if they're going to give you a million dollars, they want to see that even if you're not confident, you can simulate it because you got to go out and be confident when you're trying to sell your software to Apple or yeah. whoever it is. Right. So so that's part of the different perspective or framework that I learned from this mentorship session. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Well, I won't keep you much longer. Any other just general tips or tactics that worked for you or the question I always ask? What advice would you give your younger self if you were doing this all over again? Anything else uh, you want to add? Yeah, I think I think this lesson about archetypes and fundraising not being about like your personal dreams and personal vision, but about communication between two people, you as a founder and a corporation, and then an investor and their corporation. Yeah. And what are the mechanics and formalities that are necessary? for that communication to happen, that's different from, you know, am I building a good business or did I get an A plus on this paper? Or like, you know, it's just a totally different methodology. And so viewing fundraising as a methodology that's separate from how you feel as an individual or as a leader, mm -hmm. um, get it, get it, getting that insight earlier would be the one piece of advice that I'd love to share with younger entrepreneurs. And any of them can like tweet me or, um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I hate fundraising with a passion. So I'm always <laughs> able to, I'm always willing to share with uh, folks coming up, you know, what's been working for me. That's super great. Is it last, very, very last question, I promise. Yeah. Is there any just, you know, specific advice you would give like black founders starting out, you know, trying to navigate or figure out this world? Is there anything specific to, you know, the black founder experience or everything? You hi, hi, hire a white person to help you fundraise. <laughs> really <laughs> sorry that's the way it is man yeah so and i think i think short of that 
I spend a lot of time looking at uh, potential investors. I like to see that if I'm talking to a potential investor, there's some commitment, some long-term commitment that they've made to a black person. Do they hire black people at their job? Do they have partners who are black? Okay, maybe not. Do they have a philanthropic commitment where they're like funding, you know, black kids learning how to write computer code? And, you know, so maybe they don't have any black people at the job, but they have this long term philanthropic commitment and they're involved um, in the community in some way. What I don't want to do is spend a bunch of time trying to persuade somebody to invest in me and they've never been able to cross like the racial Rubicon. I, I don't have time for that. And so when I talk to younger uh, Black American founders, that's part of the advice that I give them. You want to find people who have an affinity of some kind to uh, to you, right? And, and any investor, that's what they're looking for. Is, uh, uh, investment is, early stage investing is affinity based, right? So you need to find out someone, if you're a rower from Harvard, hmm. your investors are rower from Harvard, that's an affinity that you guys can work around. So you want to look for those affinities um, that that reflect who you are and what you're about. And then beyond that, you got to persuade them that you're going to go make a bunch of money. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Are there any specific like black angel groups or black founder groups that you're part of or recommend people to check out or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the Black Venture Institute that I'm a part of. Okay. Um, Cohort 2, which is amazing. Um, and then... There is Black VC. Um, I'm a strong believer in what Andreessen Horowitz is doing and the ecosystem that they're putting together for Black Americans that Nate Jones and Chris Lyons and Felicia Horowitz are leading. And I'm a big believer in what K-Poor Capital is doing. So I, for Black founders and Latino founders, I would say K-Poor Capital and Andreessen Horowitz should be early stops in your journey. Um, even if they don't write a check, they're gonna, they're gonna give you some mentorship and an ecosystem that's going to help you be successful, even if you don't get an investment. So I just strongly recommend it. And again, I'm happy to give people advice and feedback, you know, one-on-one -on -one over LinkedIn or whatever um, on how to do that. Does Ben Horowitz really like rap music as much or as hip hop as much as he talks about in his books? <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Ben Horowitz. He's always he, quoting. He, he might, he might love hip hop more than me. I, <laughs> I, I love hip hop and he he might be that one white brother who loves hip hop more than me. I mean, he has a he has a poster of Nas in his office that he looks at every single day. That's funny. It's, he's the real deal. Like he's none the of real that deal. stuff, none of that stuff is false or fake or a persona. Uh, one of the things I love about Ben is he is very much who he is. And part of that is he has an authentic connection to black culture. And what's interesting is they're trying to figure out, well, how do you, how do you help African-American people in America monetize um, black culture and its role in marketing and technology and software, right? And I think that's really interesting. And I think same thing for, 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 for Mitch Kapoor, um, you know, just a genuine affinity for the life chances and economic development of low-income Black people more broadly, just mm -hmm. a genuine long-term commitment that's there and a cultural appreciation. And so I, I do think that, you know, k Capital and Andrews and Hearts, you know, despite all the media back and forth or whatever, I am here to say I'm a firm believer. Um, and, you know, look at what they've done for my company. We yeah. raise all this capital, but we, we'd be nowhere without those two firms. Cool. All right. On that note, Donnell, thank you. This is a great... Uh, block power is a block power dot b l o c p o w e r dot com correct dot i o but dot we did I -O, it dot com so it will take you there so that, no that's great G good to be here with you and yeah reach out happy to be in touch we're raising another round so we can always come back all right we'll catch you after your next round all right talk to you bye thank you thanks bye.